so tonight we're going to focus on how to pitch, present, and persuade. Uh, what I want to communicate are a lot of best practices that can help you as you get ready for the Georgetown Entrepreneurship Challenge. So three questions to think about before you pitch. First is, who is my audience? Uh, and with regards to the Georgetown Entrepreneurship Challenge, you're going to have four to six judges in your room. Uh, they will be successful entrepreneurs to unsuccessful entrepreneurs to business people, Georgetown alums. We've got kind of a broad network of uh, people we've reached out to to serve as judges. Uh, what are their expectations? Uh, so with the competition, they're expecting uh, you to be a student entrepreneur. They're not expecting you to necessarily have made any money to have a working prototype. Uh, I do think they're all going to expect you to have done some customer discovery interviews. So really, that, those are some of the key metrics you can highlight in your presentation. You know, we talked to 30 people, and 27 of them said this, uh, and 18 of them you know, said this, here's the key stats that support our hypothesis. Um, and then how can they help you accomplish your goals? Well, I think your first goal is getting an A in this class. So just by participating, I think that's going to help you achieve your goals. Uh, they can also give you feedback on the business ideas. They can give you feedback on the slides that you design and present, as well as on your overall presentation. That's kind of one of the areas that they'll be uh, judging you on for the presentation. So communication at a very high level has nothing to do with what are the actual words that I'm saying. I can say things with a big smile on my face and be engaging and lean into you and it's great. I can also say things like this and be like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> Alright, and I'm not really like, I don't, I don't care, like whatever. You know, uh, how you hold yourself and whether you cross your arms, this is a very good, powerful pose. And this is, a, notice my thumbs are in the back. This one's a little bit different. When you put your thumbs forward, you're kind of a little bit more curious. Something um, that I've learned is whenever you put your hands in your pocket, you should always leave your thumbs out. Anybody who has power doesn't hide their thumbs. These are a powerful thing. You can give the thumbs up. You kind of go like this. Uh, when you do one of these, this is like, oh, I'm deeply thinking about something. Ah, oh, yes. Um, you can also be aware of when you cover your mouth. Um, God bless you. Thank you. Um, there are a lot of nonverbal things that I'm going to rattle off here. Uh, the goal is to kind of level up your ability to read other people when you talk to them. Um, and so there's a few things. When people cover their mouth, they might be hiding something, they might not feel psychologically safe to talk. Uh, when people rub their hands on their legs, it's, it's something called numbing, or kind of like you feel a little bit of stress or anxiety. So when you see someone being like, oh, this is, this is not a comfortable person, all right? Uh, so understanding you ask a question and people start kind of scratching themselves or they start rubbing their nose, those are not signs that they're necessarily vibing with you. On the flip side, if people are leaning in, if they're smiling, if they're nodding along with you, you know, that's great. If people's eyebrows go up, they're interested. They like what you're saying. If their brow furrows, mm, they don't like what you're saying. All right? And so as you are, this is both for, you know, pitching a business. It's also for every conversation you have with people to kind of read their nonverbal communication and understand what emotions they may be communicating. If you look at the stats on the slide, 55% of what you say is just visual. So try watching like an episode of Friends or some TV show and just put it on mute and see if you can guess the plot and what's happening in the show without any dialogue going on. Um, the other thing to note is the tone of voice and the words you're saying affects what people hear. That was weird. Uh, but that's something to note too. Oh, let me talk deeper and now I'm more confident because I have a deep voice. People can literally, people that are better than me, obviously, can control the, the tone and pitch of their voice. Uh, when you hear a little uptick at the end, it often means that they're questioning, like, oh, it's my turn? You know, something like that. People are not necessarily expecting something. There's an element of surprise. Um, studies do show that if you talk with a little bit of a deeper voice, especially for the women in the room, you tend to be seen as more credible. Um, as your voice kind of has those spikes of, you know, little puberty cracks or whatever you want to call it, uh, you lose a little bit of credibility there. Uh, and this all circles back to that literally 7% is what you're saying. So the words do not matter very much compared to how you're communicating it and how people are hearing it. What does this mean? It depends on which country you are. What does it mean in your country? And not in mine, but I know it's in some of countries around the world this is like, like, F off. That is not my intention. <laughs> <laughs> Here in the U.S., we're going to go with A-OK. -okay. Maybe there's three things we want to go with. Uh, so take a look at all these different body language postures. Uh, 
Uh, everything from kind of being confused to being a little sad to blah, pulling your hair out. You know, this gentleman looks pretty handsome. He's got a nice haircut. He's clean shaven. He's got his hand open. He wants to shake your hand. Uh, his tie is all the way up in his neck. Uh, there's a lot of different emotions you can read from these different um, headshots. And think about, too, all of the different types of body language. Like, Robert, you're sitting back, you're leaning, you got your arms, you're comfortable. You feel safe. No one's coming at you. There's no issue. You don't feel threatened. Exactly. Uh, and I think that's a great posture to have, whereas, um, you know, there aren't some of the negative signs of kind of crossing your arms or crossing your legs. Uh, another really interesting thing when you're standing up, especially if you go to a networking event like the event on Thursday, look at people's feet. Where are they pointing? If I'm talking to Brendan and I'm talking to him and my feet are here, I don't want to be in this conversation. I want to get out that door. So understanding when you're in a group, like, oh, yeah, my feet are kind of straight, but then maybe I'm pointing them over here because I'd rather be talking to you even though, hey, Bailey, I'm still talking. But really, this is where my focus is. So learning how to just kind of look down and be like, huh, where are people's feet going? Where are they pointing? Where is most of their interest? Sometimes subconsciously, sometimes consciously. Again, three different poses, kind of pointing a, a very directive finger. I'm not very happy at you. And then there's the power pose. I mean, this is a pretty good all-around pose. Most people won't fuck with you if you go with this. They're like, oh, okay, that's legit. I, I respect what they're doing. Let me tell you what's going on. I want to listen to that person. Uh, part of the hope here, too, is to help you not uh, accidentally diminish your own power or your strength, the credibility you have in conversations. Uh, and encourage you to, to be stronger and to have more power and to position your body in a way that exudes that power and that confidence so that people will believe you and want to work with you. Okay, so how do you tell a story? The goal of a story is to have the story leave the room. My hope tonight is that there's at least one thing you're going to extract from this class that you're going to go home and tell a buddy about, tell your parents about, um, tweet about, I don't know, what, uh, snap, yeah, here we go. Send a Snapchat tonight to people and be like, here's a story that I learned in class tonight. All right, that's the hope. So when you go into this pitch competition, you work with these judges, they're probably going to hear 10 to 12 pitches that night. How are you going to make a lasting impression so that when they go home that night, they can remember, may not remember your name, they may not even remember the company's name, but can they remember what it is that you're doing? Uh, either the product or service you're providing or the pain point you're trying to solve. Uh, and it's really important to, um, I think I got the next slide. Yeah, there you go. And include the different elements of a story and have a narrative arc. Uh, if you've ever seen any movie ever, there's kind of the same, uh, you know, character introduction. There's some rising action. Things get exciting. Um, I'm going to use Wedding Crashers as an example. Have you guys seen Wedding Crashers? All right. So the first kind of 10-minute montage is just like, we're going to weddings. It's awesome. We're having a blast. You know, always attract attention to yourself in a positive light. Rule number 76, play like a champion. All right, this is great. Uh, and then they go to the main wedding, and they do a little flirting, and somehow they get on the boat or whatever, and they go to this massive mansion. Um, and it's still in the rising action. The characters are developing. Uh, there are some funny jokes, some of which are inappropriate, so I didn't say them. Good job. Um, and, and then we also get to the point where eventually the girl finds out that he lied, and this is the, this is the falling action. And this is when you hang out with Will Ferrell and you start thinking about going funeral crashing. You know you've reached the dip in the plot where you're going funeral crashing. Um, and think about any romantic comedy, there's always that point where somebody gets pissed off at somebody and, oh no, how will I ever recover from this? Well, guess what? There's always a resolution. That's how they make movies. Uh, you guys have seen... Um, Friends with Benefits with JT and, and Mila Kunis. Uh, there's a, you know, they build up the whole action, and then finally she gets mad at him, they break up, uh, and then at the end, that, spoiler alert, uh, there's a giant like flash mob or whatever, and they kiss and they're in love, and it's great. Um, so think about how you want to tell a story about your business idea. Uh, many people who pitch will incorporate an example of an actual person. So, for example, if you're working with refugees, you may talk about uh, a refugee, Chris, and tell Chris's story and where he was from and how he was displaced and all the struggles that he has and kind of weave that throughout your presentation. Um, part of the hope there is to, to get an emotional connection from the audience. Uh, again, human beings are much more emotional than rational, so you want to appeal to those emotions. Um, and I'll tell you a story about one of the best pitches I've ever seen. Uh, the George Tunnel on Brandon Anderson. He's got a venture, Raheem AI. Uh, and he starts every presentation, every pitch I've seen, uh, he, he'll, he'll go, raise your hands if you've ever been in love. Class, you've ever been in love? Raise your hands. You've got a couple. All right. Uh, and then he'll say, raise your hands if you've still been in love. 
<laughs> People laugh at that. That's a funny thing. Okay. Uh, and then he goes into quick word about you know I was 15. I you know I fell in love with my best friend. It was uh, rare, uh, special, and he's got a couple of other good adjectives. Uh, you know, and you know with the love of my life. And then in 2007, at a routine traffic stop, a police officer shot and killed him. Holy shit. I just got all the brain chemicals in the fields. Within 30 seconds, he's got you in love, he's got you laughing, got you having a good time, and then he has a terrible part pulled out. All right, everybody I've seen in the audience, they're leaning in. They're like, what is he doing? How can I help? I can't imagine the pain and the sorrow. Those types of powerful emotions uh, and also contrasting emotions. It's not all super high, super happy, really good, we're having a fun time. You have to have the dip and kind of pull at that other end of the spectrum to really get people to lean in. Uh, another one of the fellows at Halcyon guy, Will Avia, um, his venture, Clean Decision, works with returning citizens. And he starts his pitch uh, telling his story about being arrested and being in prison for several years and what that was like. Uh, and now he's come out of prison and is building a business to help employ and create jobs for other people that are returning citizens. Within the first 30 seconds, everybody in the room is leaning in and they're like, what you're doing, like, you're amazing, this is incredible, how can I help? Uh, and so what you want to try to create in your storytelling and in your pitches is getting people to lean in and to want to help you. And people can help in three ways, with their time, their talent, and their treasure. They will usually start with their time. Uh, and it's the initial meeting when they hear the story, and the goal of any pitch is, is often to get the next meeting. When you have the first meeting, the goal is to get the second meeting, the goal of the second meeting is to get the third meeting, and it's to give them enough information that they want to lean in, they want to learn more, and you don't want to tell them everything. You're not there to just spill your guts and give them everything. You want to give them enough so their interests are piqued, and they're curious, and they want to learn more, and they want to spend more time with you. And as you get that time, then eventually you get some of their talents, so there's maybe skills that they have, uh, places they've worked in their career, as well as folks in their network that they can connect you to. Uh, and then eventually, over time, often several meetings, usually years, um, people may consider investing or putting money in. Uh, if you're just selling your product, the, the treasure could just be you know, buying a shirt for 20 bucks. That you might be able to get in the first three meetings. Uh, it depends kind of what the, the ask is that you're looking at. All right, so let me tell you a story. Uh, last weekend, my family and I visited the Doritos farm. Uh, I don't know if you guys ever been to the Doritos farm. Let me tell you this. It is a cooler ranch. Uh, there you go. That's it. So we'll see how that landed. Not the best. That's okay. I got more. Um, so let me ask you this. Does anybody know what the digital alarm clock said to her mother? Look, Ma. No hands. So, so the, one of the goals of, of storytelling is to pass the, the roommate or the spouse test. Uh, and so when you go and you tell a story, when they're laying in bed that night, can they remember what it is you did? Can they say in one or two sentences to their significant other or their college roommate what it is you're working on? Now imagine these judges next week you're going to be pitching to, they're going to hear 12 companies pitch. Uh, candidly, I just sat through the NBA pitch competition. I could maybe tell you about three of them. Uh, and I organized the whole thing, I should know a lot more than that, but they weren't that impactful. There's an Opportunity Zone one, there's one Barks that uh, actually won and had dog food. Kick it to you ladies, can you remember any of the other companies? You're in the audience. <laughs> um, the one I remember most was Bark, but then the other one was Proof of Give about blockchain. Um, I don't completely understand. I understood what they were doing, but what were they doing? You just said you, blockchain's a buzzword. What do they do with blockchain? Um, well, so they're like validating um, donations to like nonprofits. Mm -hmm. So they're making sure that the money is going where it's said it's going to. Cool. And then there was <coughs> oh, you got one Bailey, and then we'll keep going. Yeah, sorry. There was another one where they were like selling their uh, like insurance. I think I wasn't really sure what that yeah. was about, but. I think if you had an insurance policy, but you didn't want it anymore, which is rare, you should always want your insurance policy, yeah, but you needed the stuff. cash, they would give you yeah. some cash for it. Yeah. Um, well, I just caught the tail end of it, but I remember the one about, like, it was about mailing. But I noticed that I didn't really remember what it was about because I was engaged in the pitch. Yeah. It, 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 he wasn't the most personable. It was also a random flattering of letters that I couldn't pronounce, like mail-me or yeah. something? Oh, yeah. <laughs> mail, I think it was mail-me, but it was spelled in the name. 
Yes, yeah, so that's another thing to think about is your naming stuff. If people can't remember how to spell it, they probably can't make it to your website. Think about using English words. <laughs> it works well. um, you know, it's cool to like have these funky spellings, but then every single time you're like, um, oh, my company is Coral. Oh, okay, Coral. No, Q-O-R-A-L. That's a little bit harder. Uh, in related news, all of the mental health ladies, I'm going to introduce you to the folks from Coral because they were working on a mental health company. Um, and I'm not convinced that was the best name, but that's okay. Um, another thing to note about uh, body language, especially if you're on teams for these competitions, it's really important as the secondary person who's not pitching to have a, a supportive yet not distracting posture. I have found this hand motion is a really good one. Um, it's not distracting, my arms aren't crossed. Uh, I'm not, this is kind of a defensive thing. Right here is pretty good. Uh, none. Well, yeah, I'll just share. None of you are married, but as you get older, this is a great way of saying, here's my wedding ring hand. I may or may not be married. It communicates that. Um, you notice that as you get older. Uh, I'm engaged. I'll get one of those rings eventually. Um, and so you can do that. You can also go with the hands in the pocket. I, I like the pinkies and the thumbs out. kind of hanging loose. Um, definitely don't want to hide your thumbs. That's kind of a weakening thing. Um, you can do this, but it's kind of a weird, like, <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily do that one. <laughs> that one. Um, so, would you recommend that one of us pitch, or like we have group three, so yeah. two of us pitch, and then one of us stand to the side and like manage the slides? Um, it depends. There should be somebody in the room to manage the slides for you. Yeah. I would say if only one person pitches, when you do the Q and A, say, "Hey, I'm going to invite my team members up now to handle the Q and A, and try to let everybody answer at least one question, which is partially to get everyone a speaking part." Um, I don't think you need everybody to pitch because it can be challenging and distracting to like have smooth handoffs, um, especially if there's like a clicker in one person's hand and, okay, Brennan, it's your turn. Here's the clicker. Now come on up. But like that kind of ruins the flow of, of what you're doing. Um, yes, yeah, so I would say one to two people probably max and then bring people up. You should have a team slide. Uh, I include everybody's kind of photo on there and what their major is or what their role is in the company. Uh, notice I'm doing this when you have a list of things you can count on your finger, that's a good way. Uh, the other thing about the three is, is people remember things in sets of threes, try to have a rule of three, three types of whatever it is. You get to four, five, six, seven, eight, people get distracted, they don't remember what it was. Um, let me think about this. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is the, the telephone game. You guys remember kindergarten where I would whisper something, uh, and I'll tell you what, Brennan. This is literally word of mouth marketing. This is what it's all about. You learn it in <laughs> kindergarten. There's some laughs along the way. There's uh, a great board game I'm going to recommend too called Telestrations, uh, which is basically like Pictionary with this in the middle. Uh, yeah, one of my friends got it for my dad uh, in December, and we had some fun playing it. Uh, so as you're designing your business, think about not only how do you articulate it, but how does everybody in the chain going to remember what it is that they say? And if you pass the spouse or the roommate test, uh, and it, I'm so nervous about what this is going to come out as, uh, you know, what do they remember telling their significant other? And then if their significant other goes to work the next day, what is it that they're going to share? Uh, this also comes into play as you build a supply chain. You have distributors, different salespeople, store clerks. So I'm going to take a pause here in the lecture because Mike really has to use the bathroom. I don't even know where that switch is or how that happens. But that's, that's what you have to understand uh, in how you're developing your marketing messages, your brand positioning, your value proposition. We've been over the business model canvas several times. It's a reminder because it's important, and this certainly ties into how you tell your story. This is an important one, uh, and I feel like all of us probably feel some level of self-doubt or insecurity at various times. I promise you, nobody knows what's going on. Nobody has it all figured out. So much of entrepreneurship is just being a little bit more optimistically confident than the next person. Um, and knowing that it's okay to not have it all figured out. 
I'm not trying to teach you how to be experts in anything. I'm really trying to get you that beginner's mindset, how to learn and be open to experimenting with things, knowing that failure is okay. You do these customer discovery interviews. Some people are going to slam the door in your face. They're not going to be helpful at all. They're going to think your idea is stupid. They're going to kind of get you a little bit demoralized. Uh, and that's part of the process. And there's a level of mental toughness and resiliency uh, and really grit. I think grit is the number one attribute that entrepreneurs need to be successful. And the idea of grit is if you can get knocked out oh my God. seven times and get up the end, hey, let me tell you about my company. It's really great, friend. I think you're going to love it. Uh, being able to rebound and come up and be confident. And it's all right. All right. So this, I think we've seen earlier in the semester as well, the concept of stealing like an artist. Uh, I'm have it specifically here because there's many things in this presentation that I've stolen from other people's presentations. A lot of smart people have taught me how to pitch, they've taught other entrepreneurs, and I try to learn and capture those things uh, and then share them with you all. So the first one is the Self Us Now framework. Uh, and there's a link in there to a video that we don't have enough time to watch, but I'll send it out afterwards. Uh, it's basically how Obama became president. Uh, the speech he gave at the 2004 Democrat National Convention was the best story of self story of us, story of now that I've ever seen. Uh, and so it starts with the story of self. And if you think of the Brandon Anderson example I told, you know, that's actually started with the story of us because it was raise your hand if you've ever been in love. Um, but you want to tell a story about yourself and have people um, relate it. I told you a story, um, you know, about what I got my dad for Christmas this year. I, now I'm going to ask you, are you picturing my dad or your dad in your head right now? What does my dad look like? Tim, I know what your dad looks like. I don't know what anybody else's dad looks like. Wait, do I know what your dad looks like? No, I don't. And that's the thing. When you talk about your dad, your brother, your mom, your best friend, the audience doesn't actually picture that person. They picture their type of that person. Um, so it's something to keep in mind as you think about the story of us, it's trying to bring people in and say, hey, we're like-minded. People like us do this because. You know, people like us care about fashion, and we start companies that uh, are related to fashion because we want to make the world more fashionable. People like us care about mental health. We care about college students' mental health, the challenges they're facing. We want to overcome some of the stigma and um, lack of support that students feel on college campuses and dealing with different things. Uh, and because we're the same and we're similar, let's talk about what we can do right now. How can we solve this problem? What can we do? How can we create a sense of urgency? So another thing, as you're describing what you're building, you don't want it to be a problem you're going to solve by 2050. All right? You want it to be a problem that's really important that we need to start recycling today. Like, we have to recycle or the world is going to end, yada, yada, yada. Um, global warming is a thing. Let's create some urgency. I didn't do the best job there creating urgency because I'm not as passionate about that as others. <laughs> uh, the idea, though, being that you want to engage folks. Um, this is a super helpful one-sentence pitch template, uh, and I'll send out the slides after class. Feel free to take these notes down, though, um, to articulate what it is that you're doing. Uh, and this is definitely something that could be helpful either during your customer discovery interviews uh, or as an output of talking to 10, 20, 30 folks, refining what your hypotheses are about what goes in each of those blanks. And if you see a pattern here, a lot of these things are on the business model canvas. It's almost like that canvas connects to all parts of the business. Just crazy hypothesis. I don't know. You guys test it. You guys ever ridden in an elevator? Awesome. Uh, have you guys ever told jokes in an elevator? Yeah, good. Right. <laughs> Believe it or not, this used to be a very uh, common pastime of mine because I used to live on the 12th floor. You can get a couple good jokes in or at least wait till it gets to the 5th floor knowing that it's not that funny. Um, but, uh, <laughs> maybe it will be funny, who knows. Um, so there's this Spanish magician uh, who goes on stage. And, and I want to frame this story too. Of, I actually told this to a senator, like a U.S. senator who lives in my building, happens to be on the 12th floor, and kind of saw each other. I was like, should I like talk about politics and all this stuff. I was like, no, I'm not a poor guy. I'm a joke guy. Tell my joke. So I'm like, all right, hey, you ever hear about that Spanish magician? So he goes on stage, uh, and he says, at the count of three, I'm going to disappear. Oh, okay. Uh, and the best one is, as I'm telling this, the door opens right as I get to the punchline. 
Uh, and so the magician's on stage and he goes, Uno, dos, disappeared without a trace. <laughs> that was a lot more laughter than earlier. We're building, we're building. Um, so the, the point of the elevator slide was that you should be able to communicate what you do on an elevator ride. 30 seconds or less, can you articulate what it is? What color is this cow? Purple cow. Yeah. Yeah. People talk about purple cows. People talk about things that are not normal. They are very unique. They're different. You're driving down a country road. You see a hundred black and white cows, whatever. You see a purple cow, you're like, whoa, look at that cow. Holy cow. Oh, holy cow. Uh, that one wasn't even on purpose. Um, the idea is that as you're building your business, as you're coming up with ideas, you want to be unique and different uh, and remarkable. The definition of remarkable is something to remark about. No one's going to remark about your business if it's the same as everything else. If you're not doing anything different, if there's no unique value proposition, if you're not any different than the other competitors who are already doing it and they're bigger, stronger, faster, why are people going to care about your story? Why are they going to want to tell other people about it? Why are they going to be want to be brand evangelists? They're not. So I encourage you as you think through what you're building, what makes you different, and what's that kind of one sentence thing uh, that can separate you. So something I used to do a lot at networking events, when I was running Waveborn, a lot of people would, oh, I work on the Hill, oh, I'm a consultant at this big firm, oh, I change how people see the world. You change how people see the world? Well, yeah, you know, we, we handcraft luxury Italian sunglasses by skilled artisans in Milan, Italy, the fashion capital of the world. We've got high quality polarized lenses and at the core of our business is a giving model. Notice I touch my heart and then I open it to you. It's a giving model. Think about the hand motions you can incorporate to support what it is you're saying. Uh, and, and I have people hooked. That first line gets them hooked because it is not what they're expecting to hear. All right? So, you know, somebody asks you what's your favorite class at Georgetown, you say social entrepreneurship, you'd be saying the right thing. Uh, and you also would be different than accounting or finance or whatever the other classes are that you have to learn here. I don't know why I did that for learn. But yeah. <laughs> um, so relationships are basically defined by communication and trust. And the majority of people prefer to communicate with other people they trust. If I don't trust you, I'm not going to tell you very much. I might talk to you about the weather. I might talk about this new app I have that tells me what to wear based on the weather. That's something I think you'd be interested in. Uh, the, the core here is that as you build relationships, you want to build trust. And one of the things that I've learned in the past few years is really super powerful to immediately deepen a relationship is to just ask, you know, hey, Brandon, we're talking, we're talking. Do you mind if I be vulnerable with you for a second? You can ask permission to be vulnerable. I have never, in my whole life of asking this question, had someone say, no, you can't be vulnerable. You know? Uh, and then I'll, I'll be vulnerable, and I'll, you know, share something vulnerable. Um, one of my favorite pairs of socks, um, I actually lost one of the socks in the dryer. And they're my pineapple socks. They're, like, my favorite pair of socks. You know how much I love pineapples, and I'm just... I, I got cool socks on today, but, but there's no pineapples, and I just want to let you know that I'm, I'm having a hard time with that, all right? That was a little silly. There might have been something more vulnerable in there. Uh, the concept, though, of, of willing to open yourself up will then make Brendan ideally be more comfortable being open and vulnerable with me. It develops our trust at a deeper level and enables better communication in the moment and certainly over the, the longer term of our relationship. Uh, I think when you've been through tough times with somebody, you are more likely to um, help them in future times, to tell them when you're struggling. Um, yeah, I think that that's something that I want to instill in you as well uh, as you think about building relationships. All right, so other people who had relationships were the Greeks. There were a lot of them. They talked a lot about logos, ethos, and pathos. Uh, Logos is the first one, that's your kind of uh, 2D mind, your analytical, logically does this make sense? Am I logically going to pay $20 for a t-shirt? Yeah, probably that makes sense. Uh, if it was $250 for a t-shirt, my logical brain might be like, that doesn't make sense, there's an extra zero. Uh, ethos is an appeal to ethics, um, and that's something uh, that kind of, you want to appeal to their character, uh, and I would encourage you as you think about the Georgian Entrepreneurship Challenge, to incorporate our Jesuit values into your pitches. Literally, one of the four criteria you're graded on is does it have our Jesuit values in the pitch or in the business idea. So even if it's not at the core of it, think about a fashionable way to weave that in. Um, and it might even be like, 
you know, we're going to sell it to most people, but there's going to be low-income people who only have a certain amount of clothes, and we're going to give them, you know, the app for free. Something, some way that you're helping somebody locally and or globally. Uh, it's also really valuable to understand what uh, causes are important to other people. Uh, so I use autism as an example. So one of the fellows at Halcyon, Vanessa, had a venture social cipher that developing a game <coughs> for children with autism to develop social skills. It's really cool. I think what she's doing is great. Um, what I've learned in the five months she went through the program, almost every single adult knows somebody with a child who's autistic. Like, I had no idea that, like, because it's hard to sometimes find, like, hey, do these people care about the, the environment the way I do? Do they care about police violence the way I do? Almost everybody knows somebody who has an autistic child or a special needs child and can see this being really valuable. And they probably care about that person who really cares about their kid, so if they could help them help their kid, that sounds like something they would want to do. Like, I just got some goosebumps, the brain chemicals of, like, oh, this is, this is really uh, important and something that, that would make sense to, to spread, uh, which ties directly into pathos, which is the appeal to emotion. Um, and again, that's trying to tug on some of those heartstrings and less up here, more in here, and even in your gut uh, in order to motivate and persuade people. So there's kind of an analysis versus the narrative. Um, Storytelling really ties more into the, the why and the heart, um, whereas, you know, if you, you start using more numbers, you talk about your unit economics, you should throw out your financial projections and numbers, that's a lot more logical. Uh, one other thing I'll share about presentations, throw in a super easy, like, grade three math problem, and everybody will think they're smart. If you're like, well, you know, it's, there's like two billion people, and if each of them pays us $10, that's like $20 billion. <laughs> All right. Yeah, see? And, and he's stoked about it. And he's like, yeah, I figured that out. Like, oh, I'm smart. I did it back at the math and math. Don't have like a bunch of decimal places and multiply it and be it super hard. Like, make it real simple. And then they'll feel smart. And then when they feel smart, they like you more because you subconsciously made them feel smart. It's a useful tactic. Um, all right, so 10, 20, 30 rule. There's a gentleman named Guy Kawasaki. One of the most prolific um, writers, but really like business entrepreneur gurus. Uh, I got to see him in person at South by Southwest, first time ever. It was super cool to hear him to talk about his new book, which is called Wise Guy. That's a pretty wise guy, that's what he did there. Uh, and it's all about what he's learned from entrepreneurship over the past 30, 40 years. Uh, so his whole point is you should have 10 slides for a 20 minute presentation with size 30 font. 10, 20, 30. Now, there's asterisks here because for your presentations, you should have three to ten slides. You've got five minutes. Um, and instead of size 30 font, take whoever the oldest person who's going to be in the room and divide their age by two. That's the smallest font. So if you're only pitching to a bunch of millennials, sure, you can use 10 or 12 size font. The minute you get a parent or a grandparent in that room, though, you better jack up that font size because people can't see it. You have no idea about this, but the year you all turn 40, Bailey and Yoshi, you already got it. You're going to need glasses. Nobody's eyes last past 40. Yes, Angela. If you don't know exactly who you're pitching to, like for the judges, like maybe you'll get the millennials, or maybe you'll get the judges. Air on the side of older yeah, folks. Yeah, so it's usually just go for like 30 bucks. Yeah, that's it. And maybe 28 if you're feeling risque. Um, but yeah, the, the real, the other thing to note too, and, and these don't count, like these are little footer notes, whatever you want to call them. Like this is the size it should be. And also, when you're presenting, whatever is behind you should be supporting what you're saying. And I haven't had, well, I can kind of cheat because I can see the screens, but I haven't really needed to look at the slides because I've done this presentation before. I know the order that they're going in. Um, and it's not like, well, let me read, you know, what's coming up next because here's the next thing. I don't really think I'm engaging anybody in the room right now. I'm certainly not making eye contact. Um, my body language is, is facing this way. This is not an effective way to present. So make sure you can square your hips. You can look at the audience. There's a lot of value in making that eye contact and establishing and then deepening the connection you feel with the audience um, throughout the presentation. <coughs> Any questions on that? Does that make sense before we move on? Cool. Robert, is that a question? It's just like a casual. Hey, good to see you too, Robert. All right. Um, so template for your presentation, uh, start with the problem or the opportunity, really highlight the pain point, 
what is the pain that people feel. You want the audience, you want the judges to feel that pain. Uh, and then go into what your value proposition, your solution is. Uh, you have to talk about who pays you X dollars for Y, what, whenever. Uh, you don't have to be making that money now. However, don't go through the whole presentation and never once have a dollar sign. Not that useful. Um, you can have a little bit about it, and then maybe you have an extra slide in the appendix that like really breaks down the unit economics and shows all the, the margins and stuff. Or you can just have a little bit, you know, and make it a simple math problem of, you know, there's how many students are there at Georgetown? Anybody? Seven thousand. Seven thousand students at Georgetown. You know, we hope to capture uh, fifty percent of that market and have each of them pay us ten dollars. That's thirty-five thousand dollars. You know, I was a little quick on that math. It still should be digestible um, and kind of talks through what you're doing. The competitive analysis, uh, oh, I, I don't have it in here. There are three ways, oh, look at this, three ways, to make a competitive analysis slide. The first is a grid, which is kind of like an Excel sheet with all of the features on this side, and then all of the companies and the other logos, and then the other companies all have red X's at some point, and yours is all green check marks. It's the simplest way to do it. You should always have all green check marks. Don't put on a feature you don't have. It makes you look dumb. Um, <laughs> the second way to do it is to make an X, Y axis and have a, a feature here like quality and price um, and like other logos places. And then yours is usually up here or at least over here. Um, and then the third way you can do some like complicated Venn diagram thing, kind of like the Akiji, the four circles or whatever. Um, the first one's really the simplest and it communicates it. Uh, do not put together a presentation and not at all mention competitors. Every single one of you has competitors. It may be the old way of doing it. It might just be walking into the counseling services office. Uh, you know, it might just be the university bookstores. Um, it could just be the weather app that people have. Um, you know, how do they currently do it? Uh, touch on that and highlight how you're different. Uh, another important thing when you think about the competitive analysis, you want to talk about your features. The best way to talk about features in a sentence is to say, we have this feature, which means this benefit. Which means, this is the key, this is, this is where you want to be. You can say anything, which means a benefit. So you're literally, whatever the feature is, which means a benefit. Notice how I'm kind of playfully hopping? It's a little bit more engaging. And you knew when I was here, this was the which means spot. And now I'm back in the feature spot. I can hop over the benefit spot. There are things you can do to try to be a bit more engaging when you're presenting. The last thing, uh, so you have the team. Um, throw everybody's headshots on there. Your school ID, if you've got a team photo, that's a cool way to do it. Um, after you graduate school, a couple other things that will go on the team slide is where you went to school. You throw a Georgetown logo on there. You might say what your majors were. You got your first job at Deloitte or McKinsey or wherever it was. I used to work you know, at the Red Cross, which is why I'm qualified to talk about donating blood. Not true, but that's an example. Uh, I have given blood before and I was a lifeguard, so that's kind of the same thing. Um, uh, uh, and then also on the team slide, as your companies get bigger, you'll throw advisors on there. So these may be people who they might have equity or they might just be giving you time and expertise to help. Uh, and then lastly, uh, you want to include your traction. So for you all, it's probably customer discovery, the number of interviews you've done. Um, always have an ask. Uh, judges may ask you questions like, who's your customer? How will you make any money? How many customer interviews have you done? What pain point are you solving? Be prepared to answer those questions and ideally have some of those answers baked in. Uh, that's a great question. I appreciate you asking that question. All right, that's how you build rapport and you give your brain five seconds to think about anything intelligent to say. You smile and nod. Oh yeah, that's a great question. Uh, another thing you can do is called bridging. Um, ask me a question. Oh, that's a great question. Uh, it actually reminds me of a question I'm often asked, which is, what's my favorite color? And today my favorite color is purple. <laughs> All right, if you want to get into politics, you got to get real good at bridging. It does not matter what you're asking. I'm going to say, oh, it reminds me of a question that someone else asked me. And then you ask yourself whatever question you want to answer. It works very well. Uh, watch the next round of like political debates. Uh, uh, real quick, you were born to win, uh, but to be a winner, you must plan to win. And then prepare to win, which means you can expect to win. All right? And it's 60% planning, 30% preparing, 10% expecting. This whole lecture is that 10% of expecting. I've done a lot of planning and preparing uh, to get ready. Be authentic. Uh, be yourselves. 
when you present, don't try to be a fictitious character. Don't try to be a different version of yourself. Uh, don't wear masks that you think you have to do things a certain way so people will like you or you'll do a good job. Be yourselves. And I think people can really tell when you're being yourself and you're being authentic. They can also tell when you're full of shit. So if you have two options, I would encourage you, not only in your pitches, but in your relationships and your conversations, to be authentic. All right, we've got, that. We've got two slides left. All right. Oh. Wherever you're facing, we're going to do four breaths. All right? I'm going to face this way because the first thing we're going to do is take a deep breath in and exhale to that corner. I'll take another deep breath in, and we're going to exhale to that corner. Now here's the magical part of this exercise. We're going to take a deep breath in, and we're going to exhale to the back left corner behind us. I'm going to take one more deep breath in, and we're going to exhale to that back right corner. Does the room feel bigger? Does it feel a little bit bigger? It's not like we're in a trash compactor. Any stress or anxiety you were feeling might be a little bit lessened. Uh, the powerful thing about this exercise, you can do it in any class. You can do it in any meeting. You're, you're in a meeting and people are pissing you off. Just take a few deep breaths. And, and I also, I have a hypothesis that as you did those breaths, you also identified where the exit was. And whether or not you realize it, your, your one-dimensional mind, the fight, flight, or freeze, knows the exit, so they're not worried anymore. They know, if I had to get out of here, I could go pee right out that door. All right? Um, this is a really powerful mindfulness uh, tactic that I want to share. Just so, before you're getting up there, you might have all these nerves. Like, take a few breaths. Identify where the exit is in case you freak out in minute three and you got to sprint out, you at least know where to go. And the last thing with every pitch is always have an ask. And so my ask for you uh, tonight is that hopefully there was a story that's worth sharing, something that will leave this room. It may not be my Doritos joke. It could be another joke. It could be another thing you learned. Uh, notice my voice was a little different there. I was kind of asking, like, do they like me? I don't know. Um, and then I also want to encourage you to check out the eship.georgetown.edu website. There's some cool stuff on there. Um, and answer your question, Angela. Yeah, if anybody wants pizza, uh, Professor Malloy is putting on like an extension of this pitch workshop for my residents.